Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Andrew Y. Glickson. He's an earth and paleoclimate scientist. He graduated at the University of Western Australia in 1968. He conducted geological and geochemical surveys of the oldest geological formations in Western and Central Australia, South Africa, India, and Canada. He studied large asteroid impacts, including effects on the atmosphere, oceans, and mass extinction of species. Since 2005, he has studied the relations between climate and human evolution. He was active in communicating nuclear and climate change evidence to the public and parliament through papers, lectures, conferences, and presentations, and also uh, books. Um, so my first question is, uh, you have a book called The Plutocene, Blueprints for a Post-Anthropocene Greenhouse Earth. Uh, what is the Plutocene? Okay, well, plutonium um, is the source of the term. Plutonium is already accumulating at the bottom of the oceans as a result of um, nuclear tests, uh, pollution, and spills. So in uh, geology, we sometimes uh, name geological periods after the markers or after fossils uh, and so on. In this case, uh, what I propose is that uh, the um, build-up of a layer of plutonium in the oceans is a result of tests which already have been carried out, spills which already have occurred, but also the possible potential of a, a nuclear war. Uh, this layer of plutonium uh, will mark the period that we're living in. And should there be future geologists, that's one thing they're going to identify. Uh, it signifies uh, the nuclear age. It signifies uh, some of what is happening at the present time and potentially in the future. So let's back up a second and uh, tell listeners what precisely plutonium is, um, what is what are dangers associated with plutonium? What are what are the uses of plutonium? Why why is this culture why is this culture associated with plutonium? Just give us a real basic overview of that. Well, it's a radioactive element. It's artificial. It's uh, very rarely, if ever, occurs in nature, but it's uh, produced in nuclear reactors and from nuclear explosions. It uh, has a lifespan of um, longer than um, 200,000 years. And that's, uh, but the half-life is uh, shorter than this. Uh, it's uh, highly poisonous, toxic uh, to organisms of any kind, especially if it's breathed in. It's, um, uh, in a way, a symbol, a sign of... Uh, uh, humanity creating up an artificial element which uh, is toxic to to the environment, to the biosphere. Uh, in that respect, respect plutonium is uh, highly significant both in reality and also uh, uh, in the metaphoric sense. So do we, do we know, I mean, there, there, okay, first off, how much plutonium is, is, uh, is now accumulating at the bottom of the oceans, and uh, B, is there any idea what effects that might already be having on the oceans? It's toxic for any life forms. Uh, if it's taken in, uh, the slow process, uh, how much there is, this varies. It's not uniform. Uh, even though it settles from the atmosphere, there will be different concentrations in different parts of the oceans. The concentrations are extremely low, but uh, it's such a toxic element that it will still have a major effect. And what about current... So is this culture, excluding what's already out in the oceans and everywhere else, is there is this culture continuing to make more plutonium, or is it trying to clean up the messes? Every day that passes... Is, is, are things worse for the planet in this way, or are things getting better? Uh, that's a very broad question. Global warming, climate change, uh, and nuclear pollution, uh, now not so much from nuclear tests, but uh, from industrial spills and leaks and accidents, that's uh, developing, that's going all the time. 
and so this might make a, a nice uh, nice is not a really good word a transition to to also talking about nuclear uh, talking about global warming do you you have written about how well let me just read what you what you wrote um, on January 27, the Bulletin of the Atomic, this is a couple years ago, uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the arms of his doomsday clock to 2.5 minutes to midnight, the closest it's been since 1953. Meanwhile, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels now hover above 400 parts per million. Next, and here's the question, why are these two facts related? And then you go on to answer that. So could you answer that for us? They are related in terms of the consequences. Uh, nuclear pollution and radiation is toxic. It depends on the level, but in many instances, uh, such as in Chernobyl or Fukushima, the levels have uh, risen to a toxic level where uh, humans or other forms of life will not um, be able to survive for longer than sometimes a few hours uh, and mostly a few days or weeks. Uh, global warming is changing up the nature of the biosphere. It's changing the conditions. Uh, on the planet, uh, if I can bring an example, uh, we breathe, um, our lungs process uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen, but if the level of one of them increases in a significant way, such as carbon dioxide, we can get sick. It's called hypercapnia. We can get very sick if we have excess carbon dioxide in the lungs. That's an analogy. This level has not been reached yet, but it could be in future. As to the biosphere, the atmosphere uh, acts as the lungs of the earth. Uh, it exchanges, uh, silicate the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. So the two um, type of dangers uh, are not the same, but the consequences are of both of them are fatal. And let's go back. Let's go back for a moment. Well, actually, I want to continue with global warming for a minute. Can we? Can we? I mean, much of your work traditionally, uh, you have written about, for example, the uh, asteroid impact connection to planetary evolution. Can you talk about what, in the past, has been a relationship between global warming and biodiversity, or between well, extinction asteroid, spasms? The asteroid impact studies is what triggered me to look at the climate and global warming because. After following major asteroid impacts, you have a large-scale changes in the composition of the atmosphere, temperatures, and so on, uh, with resulting shift in <coughs> excuse me, atmospheric conditions and the mass extinction which follows. Now, um, global warming, of course, is not caused by uh, the same uh, factors which initiate... Uh, the past geological mass extinctions, but the consequences in terms of a shift in state of the atmosphere are in a way pretty similar and pretty major. Uh, can you be more specific on the impacts are pretty major? That's because we're talking about life on the planet. So let's let's get more specific about that if we can. I take it you're talking about asteroid impacts. Oh, actually, I was talking about. Um, my understanding, and let me know if this is wrong, is my understanding of the of one of the primary causes of biodiversity crash during rapid changes in temperature is that much of the is much of the many of the most rich places on the planet are um, are in coastal either low elevation or in shallow water, and so when you have some sort of rapid uh, change in in ocean depth, that can be pretty cataclysmic for those who live in those areas. It's not so much to do with uh, shallow oceans. Uh, it's to do with the rate, the speed of the change. Uh, during geological periods, um, uh, changes in carbon dioxide, temperature, and all other parameters, in most instances, have been gradual and slow, and species could adapt to these changes. But when the rate of change is as high as it is following an impact by an asteroid or very major volcanic event, or global warming, which are carrying out an extreme rate, it's the fastest rate that um, we can look at it uh, during the last 55 million years. 
when the rate of change exceeds the capacity of species to adapt, that's when you get extinction. And and that is something that we are seeing. This, this is exactly what's happening. But of course, mass extinction, of certainly due to global warming, the present, it's not exclusively due to climate change. There are other factors: the destruction of habitats, deforestation, the uh, chemical uh, spraying of uh, crops and forests. Uh, fires and many other factors combined, but in the background of it all is global warming. So, what do you see? I have, I have an environmentalist friend who often says that if we keep going where we're going, then we will get to where we're going. Except he says it better than that. So, can you lay out a between? plutonium, global warming, can you lay out a future if this culture continues to do what it is doing? Well, if a, a global warming continues and it's um, projected to rise even as high as uh, 4 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, even this century, if it continues at this rate within the century, then when you talk about the future, you're talking about something which we are losing. And what the, the 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 projections that I've seen for these these increases in temperature have generally not they they have generally presumed a sort of business as usual attitude or minor adjustments. But in in your understanding, at least. What do you think would and let's ex, let's ignore plutonium for a moment. What do you think would would happen in terms of climate change if all let's say let's say that that all humans disappeared tomorrow and so we have an immediate reduction to zero of of CO2 emissions from industrial civilization and at the same time we presumably have a beginning of recovery of sea grasses uh prairies um, grasslands, forests. Um, do you do you think that uh, methane releases, etc., have already been set in motion such that the planet would not be able to t- to reabsorb in any sort of meaningful time? Would we still be set for some sort of absolutely dramatic warming? Well, you have now asked a number of questions. And uh, sure, take any uh, of them you want. I don't see it this way. For one thing, I don't think that all humans will disappear. A very large number, and of course, um, animals and insects and so on in nature will suffer terribly. But uh, I don't see it as a linear process. Uh, It's portrayed by the IPCC as a gradual growth in temperature. But we already see a series of major uh, extreme weather events which tells us there is nothing gradual in what's happening now. It's estimated that uh, several hundred thousand people have already uh, died and many more got sick as a direct or indirect uh, consequence of global warming. Well, as this can only continue as temperatures rise, but they're not rising in any gradual sense, uh, unlike the projections of the IPCC, which show you uh, smooth curves, uh, it's uh, much more likely to happen in a series of cataclysms, a series of um, major shifts. Uh, and again, um, particularly in some parts of the world, uh, such as the island, the Caribbean islands, the southwest uh, Pacific islands, you now have increasing uh, tsunamis, uh, storms, and uh, these are the regions which are vulnerable or much more vulnerable than some other regions. So there are parts of the Earth, for example, um, the subarctic, where temperatures are rising and will continue to rise, but uh, it's still temperatures are still uh, consistent with um, with human existence. But there are other parts, uh, like in the tropics or in the desert, where temperatures will exceed the ability of the human body to uh, survive. So uh, we have to be specific about it. Uh, 
it's not an overall calamity, it's a series of calamities or disasters. And overall, uh, there is a synergy so that the climate uh, is shifting, the state of the climate is shifting uh, across tipping points and uh, regionally, not globally at the same time, but in different regions and different stages. The picture is complex and it's been simplified. And it's been simplified so much that it's become meaningless. So I'm, I'm sorry my question wasn't really clear. The, the, the focus wasn't on human extinction. The focus was, was on the uh, trajectory that has already been put in place and the capacity of the Earth to uh, reabsorb carbon if not further harmed. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I, I know that, and we both know that seagrasses, for example, sequester tremendous amounts of carbon and that also seagrasses are under threat around, around the world. And I guess, can you talk for a moment about, well, I guess let's back up and go a different direction and, and talk about how, how have, under previous cataclysmic climate change periods, how has the Earth eventually eventually found a new a new point of stability, of climate stability? I remember okay, so my first degree is in physics and I remember I took a class on this is nineteen eighty one or eighty two and even then at the school where I went, they were talking very openly about global warming, and they were talking about how it's it will generically how, how you might be in a stable state, and you can the temperature can go up a little bit, down a little bit, up a little bit, down a little bit, but if it goes past a certain point, then it will shoot forward to a new a new stability point. So, can you talk a little bit about that, and can you talk about how in times past in Earth history it eventually did arrive at a new equilibrium? How does that work? Well, stability is a concept, but mostly when you look at the history of the atmosphere, there is no stability. The climate always changes, but it changes mostly within certain parameters. So uh, you can talk about relative stability, but <clears throat> what's happening uh, following uh, major events, whether it's asteroid, <clears throat> whether it's volcanic events, or whether it's global warming uh, triggered, initiated by uh, carbon pollution, What's happening here, the pollution is a trigger, it's the first factor, but this activates uh, what's called feedback effects, amplifying feedbacks, which means as the um, glaciers, the sea ice recedes, they also absorb more infrared, warm up, cause more melting of ice, whether at the sea or on the continent, uh, the warming also triggers um, release of methane. Uh, uh, warm water cannot contain as much um, carbon dioxide, so it's uh, sequestered to a lesser extent. There is no stability. It triggers up a whole series of amplifying feedbacks, uh, and these are the ones which uh, they exceed the magnitude of the initial trigger. Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing. Uh, the talk about stability is uh, it's really wishful thinking because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for tens of thousands of years. And um, if it grows as it grows uh, due to release of carbon from the uh, biosphere, which contains hundreds of billions of tons of carbon, then the process goes on until the rate of increase, carbon increase, uh, declines. But... Uh, uh, the concept of stability in our present circumstance is uh, is really something which we might hope for, but I cannot see it happening in the physical world. You mentioned these feedback loops. Can you talk a little bit? People might might know a little bit. They may have heard about methane, for example, but can you talk about some of these some of the results, well, either of methane or also of Arctic ice loss. In one of your papers, you said that the uh, last significant Arctic ice loss occurred around 125,000 years ago when summer insulation of the Arctic climate increased by 11 to 13 percent, causing a large, 
a large loss of ice. Can you can you talk about the dangers of Arctic ice loss? Well, these are the natural uh, cycles. Uh, what's right. Called the, it's what's called the Milankovic Milankovic cycle, when uh, solar insulation increased and it is increased approximately every hundred thousand years over the last uh, million years or so. These are the natural uh, solar-induced uh, uh, rhythms or cycles. But what we're looking at now is uh, major injections of carbon dioxide, uh, which uh, is changing the uh, picture entirely. When you look at the plots, at the graphs, uh, in the past, even the last uh, deglaciation or glacial termination lasted for about three to 4,000 years. Now, within virtually less than a century, uh, we are looking at um, an increase in temperature at a rate um, greater than that which happened um, during the last glacial termination. So we can't even compare it. Uh, what's happening now in terms of the rate of uh, carbon and temperature variations is closer to what happens when you get uh, global volcanic eruptions or an asteroid impact much closer to that than to any of the uh, previous uh, natural cycles. So can you talk a little bit about how volcanic eruptions led to have led to global warming before? Because you would think with a, a volcanic eruption that it could then uh, cause some global dimming, which w- or some solar dimming, which would lower the temperature. But in fact... Uh, at least one or two of the previous mass extinctions were probably global warming caused by volcanoes. So no, um, volcanic eruption will result in the injection of aerosols, which are relatively short-lived. That sulfur dioxide and dust and so on. Relatively short-lived. You're looking, looking here at a few tens to a few hundred years, maybe a thousand or so. But it also uh, releases carbon dioxide which lasts on a scale of thousands to tens of thousands of years. So you have to uh, distinguish between the two types of um, emission and the consequences. So let's go back to the plu- plutonium. Is, the, is, your, is your major concern about the effects of plutonium on, or the, about the release of plutonium, is your major concern the plutonium that is already in the biosphere, or is it the release of additional through whatever means, including nuclear war? Now, the risk of plutonium has already existed. It's uh, local on organisms which live around the higher concentrations. Uh, plutonium is not the factor that already is operating in terms of mass extinctions in any measurable way, only minor way. Uh, when you're asking me why do I emphasize plutonium, well, in, the, in my background, I'm a geologist, and in the future, if there are any geologists, they will um, identify plutonium, a layer of plutonium in the oceans, as the marker, the geological marker for what is happening now. But you have to think about the effects of radiation and plutonium separately from the effects of global warming. They are not the same, although the consequences of both can be little. If you're looking at radiation, it is a um, nuclear exchange which which can cause the death of um, well, many, many millions uh, of people and organisms. Uh, this is a, a one-time event, or perhaps multiple-time event, uh, and it's fatal. But uh, when you're looking at the biosphere as a whole, I mean, it's fatal, but it's also somewhat regional. It depends on the migration of the uh, radiation clouds. But when you're looking at the biosphere as a whole, it's a change of the composition of the atmosphere, uh, increase in uh, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide, and methane, which are the factors that are changing the entire uh, well, it's like the lungs. Again, I come back to the lungs. If our lungs are saturated or have extreme uh, levels of um, carbon dioxide, even oxygen and so on, uh, we, we cannot survive for very long. The biosphere uh, 
depends on exchange of these gas, the gases between the atmosphere and between plants and animals. So let's go back to global warming again, and you cite uh, you cite James Hansen as saying that. Well, actually, I want to go with a 2010 statement by the Prime Minister of Australia. We are, as humans, conducting a massive science experiment with the planet. It's the only planet we've got. We know the consequences of unchecked global warming would be catastrophic. So you've you've been hitting this really well. And can you can you talk a little bit more about what what the world could look like? You have one article that was about what Australia could easily look like. I'm looking for the article right now. So can you talk a little bit about what you could a little bit more about what you could see what you could see in the future? Well, um, I don't have a looking glass uh, to look into the future in terms of precise events and precise timing. Uh, I don't think anybody has that. Uh, But what we have is a measurement of trends and we know the basic physics and chemistry of the atmosphere, how they change when one major component like carbon uh, is rising. So uh, there are trends, and there are the more likely trends, and there are the ones which are less confident. What I see, the warming is already, if you're looking at Australia, we already have temperatures of 40 degrees and higher in uh, central and northern Australia, and, and even here. In the south, we had a few days or a week of uh, temperatures very close to 40. Uh, what you're looking at is a series of extreme weather events, and when that's combined over a period to a trend, then you're looking at a trend which is really not very promising in terms of um, our survival. And what do you... How, and I recognize fully that the crystal ball is always cloudy, but how, at this point, how locked in do you perceive this future? And then my question after that is going to be, what, what would be, if, if you were, if you were to be able to significantly influence, uh, social behavior, what would be your recommendations? So, but first, how locked in do you think the current the current trajectories are? Well, I don't think in terms of locked in. This is not a term that you want to use in in science. There are basic laws of physics. They are determined, verified, and proven. But uh, to say that the future future events are locked in, it's not a term or language I'd use. What I'd say there are projections, and some of them are more likely than other ones. Uh, while the globe is bound and already is warming and warming extremely fast, uh, it's not going to be linear or gradual because as the ice melts, the big ice sheets melt, sea level rise, but also cold water flow from the glaciers into the oceans and cool large regions of, for example, the North Atlantic, even the Central Atlantic, also um, the Subantarctic Ocean will cool, so you will get periods which uh, we call them stadials. A stadial is a temporary freeze. So as global warming continues, it activates glacier melting, cold water, and local to regional freezes. Uh, That's significant, and this has not been um, discussed very much by the IPCC. What do I see further in the future? But due to the amplifying feedbacks, even if uh, humanity stops emitting carbon altogether, they will need to draw down, sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere on a very large scale, if possible. Uh, The methods are known in principle, but not in scale. Uh, Drawing down carbon dioxide would require budgets on the scale of trillions. That's the sort of budgets which are currently directed into the military and wars and bombing around the, around the world. I, I can only see now, I think that we are already crossing tipping points. Uh, but the only way which I can see to cool the air, so at least uh, 
stop the rapid uh, heating warming is to draw down carbon dioxide. But unfortunately, the powers to be don't seem to be too interested in that. So if if you were made the uh, the the czar or king or emperor of all things global warming, how would you draw down? I mean, we're only talking about life on this planet, you know. So how would you draw down? If you could affect policy in some significant way, how would you begin to draw down carbon and sequester it? What are some of the primary and strong possibilities? Well, for one thing, uh, it will need diversion of the trillions of dollars which go into the military and into war because it will have to be a global effort. Now there are a number of methods like uh, seagrass, the planting uh, and feeding uh, of seagrass around shallow seas right around the world. It will help. It sucks the carbon dioxide from the water, but eventually when the plants decay, it releases it again. Biochar, which means enriching the soil in carbon, uh, it will increase fertilization of the soil, uh, increase plant growth, and plants uh, suck, they absorb carbon dioxide. Then there are some chemical, uh, reef, reforestation is an obvious one. The trees will suck carbon dioxide. There are chemical methods, for example, crushing basalt and serpentine, which is done to some extent, I think, in Iceland, uh, will result in combination of this crushed basalt with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This creates carbonates. That's one way of doing it. It's to be done on a very large scale, and the crushing, of course, requires machinery, and once again, emission of carbon dioxide from that machinery. Uh, They were talking about sodium trees, which is sodium hydroxide uh, systems in pipelines which absorb carbon dioxide and convert it into sodium carbonate. All of those methods are known in principle, but in order to affect the atmosphere, uh, you will need to do, they will need to do it on a global scale. And whether this is possible or human nature is going to allow it, because God knows. Well, it seems, it seems, it's always seemed to me that, that reforestation, uh, allowing grasslands to come back, seagrass, mangrove swamps, etc., is, is the way to go. Whether, whether it happens politically is a whole other question. No, re- reforestation and seagrass are quite separate entities, and reforestation and even small grasses, uh, trees absorb a large amount of carbon dioxide. Grasses absorb much less, and of course sea grasses are in the ocean. So we're talking about different things. So because these are very large scale, what what do you actually want people who read your work to to do? Do you want and and what do you want people who hear this interview to do with the information that we that we that we have here. What what is your what is your what is your optimal possibility for what 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 you want the effects of your work to be on on the present and future and on what humans do? Well the basic thing people need to be aware of what they're doing. They need to be aware that they are actually destroying nature as we know it. Uh, and once they understand that and understand the reason and how it's happening, well, then they have to uh, direct their uh, leaders and governments to take uh, the most promising methods that we have, which is what I just uh, listed before, the carbon sequestration now seems to be. You see, if they stop emitting right now, it will still make minor difference because of the amplifying feedbacks. Already, temperatures have risen to an extent (coughs) that, for example, they're activating the release of methane from permafrost, from lakes, from shallow oceans. Uh, Warming ocean absorb less carbon dioxide. The forest which uh, humanity has cut is another factor. 
the fires which are now raging in many parts of the world, they release uh, carbon dioxide. The list goes on and on. Uh, what do I wish? Well, first I wish that, that people will be aware of what's, what's happening. And once they are, that they will take the required measures. The government will take the required measures. But, of course, as you know, vested interests come in the way. Uh, the profits of the uh, fossil fuel industry seem to be only growing, and the governments, I don't think governments have that much power uh, over the vested interest, uh, uh, whether it's uh, fossil fuels or even even the military. These are huge concerns. The world's two biggest interest industries is fossil fuels and the military, the military-industrial complex. And they uh, follow their own momentum. You have a wonderful quote at the beginning of your uh, article called The Orwellian Climate and Faustian Bargain. And first off, you start with a quote by George Orwell, which is 2 plus 2 is 5 if the party says so. And then you say, should anyone record the history of the 20th and 21st centuries, they may report that while temperatures and sea level sea levels were rising, the human sense of reality has been clouded by electronic system, including television, the internet, and smartphones, by science fiction, virtual realities, public circuses, fake news, gratuitous hype, and superlatives overtaking common sense and the quest for protection of the earth and the survival of the species. So first, thank you for that great quote, and second, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Well, we know that uh, entire societies can get off the rail. Uh, this has happened uh, in Germany from 1933 that uh, supported the most murderous regimes that ever existed. Entire societies can. Uh, and it's a question to what extent. Uh, at the present time, uh, you can see it uh, when electronic devices take over human common sense. Uh, if you're exposed, say, if a child is exposed to what's showing up on TV and commercial TV uh, many hours in the day, it cancels out what they learn at school. Uh, it gives them a false uh, impression of reality. Uh, they end up living in some science fiction or some series of uh, homicidal and genocidal movies. I, every time I switch on the TV, I become aware that it's, it's like a mirror in that uh, generation go in front of it and absorb up the value, the lack of value, and the, um, the atrocities, really, that they see. And this must have an effect. Uh, it's uh, a kind of massive brainwashing that, even, that George Orwell was talking about in his uh, book, 1984. Uh, I think common sense and sanity are on the decline. I'm afraid so. Yeah, I would completely agree. You have another another great paragraph from that same article. Is hoodwinked by the half truths of conscience free mainstream media, the inhabitants of suburbia international have become more interested in cricket ball tampering, Eurovision tile, Eurovision type circuses, and royal weddings, allowing the powers to be that be to proceed with policies leading toward ecocide and genocide. It's like I'm not sure I've seen a better a better encapsulation of the effects of on this insanity that you're talking about. That's right. That's right. Uh, people escape. They have to escape because even people who are aware of uh, what's happening uh, find themselves powerless. Uh, the issue is just too huge. Uh, governments are non-responsive, to say the, the least. But even if governments decided to do something, there is a factor of time. If uh, about 40 years ago, 1980, when carbon dioxide levels were 350 parts per million or less, if they tried to do something then to stop emissions or even start sucking down carbon dioxide, maybe, maybe, maybe they would have been successful. But they left it for 40 years. And now, who knows whether even if they do all the right things, it's going to be effective. It will have to be the biggest project which humanity ever took to try and return the atmosphere even partly into the conditions which allowed uh, really the humans to uh, 
develop agriculture. Uh, the picture is dire, uh, but at the same time, we have to admit that people can only live one day at a time, which means you have to have hope within the time frame that we have. So we can't just uh, dwell on the gloom and doom because then we're wasting what little we have. Uh, I try and live one day at a time. Uh, and as to the trend and uh, what's um, happening in nature and so on, I think we see it, we now understand it, but uh, I'm afraid the train has left the station. Well, I think, like you said earlier, the crystal ball, I mean, we don't have crystal balls, or if they are, they're very cloudy. And it's its like a um, an environmentalist friend of mine always says that we can't predict the future. So as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to do whatever he can to make sure some doors remain open, by which he means protecting every wild place, protecting wild beings, protecting, you know, protecting as much seagrass or grassland or, or forest as possible. Well, it's uh, it's what's called the Dutch boy syndrome, you know. The uh, dam starts to leak, and the boy in the Netherlands, he puts his finger into the leaking holes, but he runs out of fingers, too many leaks. Uh, what's going to happen is not entirely clouded because the level of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is rising and that's bound to continue to warm the earth. But it's not a linear, not a smooth curve. That's where problems have arisen and that these factors have been overlooked. The melting of the uh, Antarctic and Greenland ice are going to result in major intermediate term uh, temporary, transient or temporary cooling of large regions, uh, which is uh, going to result in storminess, because while the tropics continue to warm, some parts of the sub-Arctic are going to cool down, and this results in temperature gradient changes or other polarities, which um, result in storminess. Uh, A lot of the projections, uh, best projections, which I'm aware of are by Uh, James Hansen and his group. It's a very large group, some 20 uh, climate scientists and paleoclimate scientists who uh, have been studying uh, various uh, detailed aspects of um, uh, past, present, and future scenarios. And so their papers, to me, are the most credible that I have read. But there are a lot of other credible papers. The IPCC is based on the peer review literature but the summary for uh, policy makers is, I'm afraid, a little bit watered down or has been watered down. For, for example, they haven't taken into account uh, the rates of um, ice melt melts of the great of the big uh, glaciers. They said until recently that uh, this remains uh, unknown, unclear, unmeasured. But at the very same time, glaciologists have been monitoring the big ice sheets and it's now clear that they are breaking down at an alarming speed. Uh, so the IPCC was trying, well, based on peer review literature, and essentially correct, they're trying not to be what's called alarmist. Well, I, th- I think that when there is a fire going on, there's not a problem. I mean, I, I don't think that sounding an alarm is a problem. Um, I think sounding an alarm is the right thing to do. And uh, we're pretty much out of time here, and I would like to thank you so much for for your incredible work, and I would like to thank you for being on the program. I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Andrew Y. Glickson. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.